La Carlota Air Base, Caracas. The radar screens glow green. S-300 batteries, tracking the northern horizon. S-400 systems, scanning for high altitude threats. Early warning radars, watching 200 miles into the Caribbean. Everything reads normal. And then, in the span of a military briefing, South America's most advanced integrated air defense network ceased to exist. Not damaged, not degraded, deleted. Here's the paradox. Venezuelan radar operators could see 150 aircraft on their screens throughout the operation. They tracked flight paths. They monitored altitudes. They watched the entire show. They just didn't realize. They were already blind. Most people assume modern warfare is about who shoots first. They're wrong. Modern warfare is about who knows first. And the USS Gerald R. Ford had spent six weeks learning every secret Venezuela didn't know they were telling. This wasn't an airstrike. It was applied mathematics. A calculated sequence executed with surgical precision to erase an entire nation's defenses faster than their command structure can react. You don't need overwhelming force. You need overwhelming knowledge. Six weeks machine of intensive intelligence operations. That's all it took. If you're proud of American engineering that turns information into inevitability, type proud in the comments right now. Today, Navy Decoded is breaking down the six-week invisible war that preceded the visible operation, the physics that made radar systems useless, and the sequential erasure that turned a modern military into expensive equipment with no one left to operate it. This is Operation Absolute Resolve, but the real operation started mid-November 2025 when the USS Ford transited through Anagata Passage into the Caribbean. Mid-November, 2025, the USS Gerald R. Ford entered the Caribbean. The public mission, Operation Southern Spear, counter-narcotics operations, legal under international law. The real mission, building a complete digital twin of Venezuela's entire military infrastructure in just 48 days. Here's the engineering problem. To execute a perfect strike, you need perfect information, not just where the radars are, but when they're active, not just where the missiles are, but who has authority to launch them. The USS Ford doesn't take pictures. It listens continuously. The E-2D Advanced Hawkeye flies at 25,000 feet in circles 200 miles offshore. Every radar system emits electromagnetic radiation. That pulse radiates in every direction. The E-2D's APY-9 radar detects those emissions from 300 miles away and records them. The frequency, the pulse repetition rate, the scan pattern, the GPS coordinates. Every time Venezuela turned on a radar, they were teaching us their electronic fingerprint. For six weeks, the E-2D flew continuous missions, 24 hours a day, recording, cataloging, building a database. The F-35C, provided visual confirmation. It can fly with its radar completely off, while six electro-optical targeting system sensors record everything. Infrared signatures, communication patterns, patrol schedules, shift changes. Do the math with me. Six weeks, two E-2D missions per day, four F-35 sorties per day, over 400 intelligence gathering flights, by early January, the United States had perfect knowledge. Every radar position, every command bunker, every communication frequency, every shift change, every weakness. But there's a second element even more brilliant, normalization through violence. Between mid-November and early January, U.S. forces conducted 35 strikes against drug boats in the Caribbean. Every single strike showed up on Venezuelan radar Every one required their operators to track U.S. aircraft and do nothing. Because the strikes weren't against Venezuela, they were legal counter-narcotics operations. 
Venezuelan radar operators were being conditioned to see U.S. military operations as routine, normal, background noise. By early January, when the Ford positioned itself 50 miles offshore with 12 warships, Venezuelan commanders didn't see an invasion force. They saw six weeks of normal operations continuing, nothing unusual. This is the normalization doctrine. You gradually increase presence until overwhelming force becomes invisible. And when the operation began, Venezuela's defenses just continued treating U.S. aircraft as they had for six weeks, as background noise, until it was too late. The USS Jason Dunham sits 40 miles offshore, Arleigh Burke-class destroyer. Tonight, its Mark 41 vertical launch system is loaded with Tomahawk Block 4 cruise missiles. The order comes, cell doors swing open, the first Tomahawk launches, then another in rapid sequence. A dozen missiles arc into the night sky, but they don't climb high. They nose down to 50 feet above the ocean. Here's the physics. Radar can't see over the horizon. The formula is simple. Detection distance equals the square root of two times the radar height. A radar at 300 feet elevation sees 50 miles to the horizon. Anything below that line is invisible. The Tomahawk flies at 50 feet using terrain-following radar. Venezuela is mountainous. The missiles fly through the valleys, following rivers using terrain masking. At 550 miles per hour, the missile covers ground fast but to radar operators, nothing appears until the last three miles. At Mach point 75, three miles takes 15 seconds. Not enough time to react. The Tomahawks hit nodes. Early warning radar at La Guaira. Radar arrays at Higuerote. Communication taps on Mount Avila. Think about what this does to an integrated network. It's like severing the optic nerve. The eyes are still there. They just can't send information to the brain. Venezuelan S-400 systems remain operational. Their launchers are armed, but they have no early warning, no targeting data, no coordination. A $500 million air defense system becomes an expensive sculpture, beautiful, functional, isolated, useless. The Tomahawks also hit communication nodes, the bunkers that relay orders from command to field units. Not destroyed, disabled, antennas sheared off, power systems disrupted. The bunker survives, but can't talk to anyone. This is node deletion. You don't destroy the enemy's military. You destroy their ability to command it. The organism stays alive. The nervous system dies. The Tomahawks opened a corridor. Now, the hammer falls. FA-18 EF Super Hornets, launched from the USS Ford, full combat load. Two, 2,000-pound GBU-31 JDAM bombs, AGM-154 J Sow glide weapons on wing pylons. The Super Hornet doesn't have stealth. It doesn't need it. The air defense network is already blind. The GBU-31 JDAM is GPS-guided. Circular error probable of five meters. That's geometry, not marketing. The bomb falls toward GPS coordinates with guaranteed accuracy, and it carries 2,000 pounds of high explosive. The targets aren't radar stations. Tomahawks handled those. The targets are command bunkers, underground facilities where decisions get made. Fuerte Tiuna military complex, hardened command center in a hillside, three-foot-thick reinforced concrete. At terminal velocity, a 2,000-pound bomb hits with millions of foot-pounds of kinetic energy. The overpressure wave propagates through rock and concrete. Structural supports fail. The facility becomes unsurvivable. La Carlota Air Base Coordination Center, the facility that would authorize fighter launches. The building survives. The communications infrastructure inside does not. Venezuelan fighter aircraft sit on runways, fueled, armed, ready. But no one has authority to launch them. The person who gives that order is in a bunker with no working communications. Do the math. 
An Air Force with no command authority isn't an Air Force. It's a museum with jets that have fuel in them. The Super Hornets complete their strikes and return to the Ford. Not a single Venezuelan aircraft takes off. Not because they couldn't, because the chain of command is broken at every link. The EA-18G Growler doesn't carry bombs. It carries electrons. 5 ALQ-249. Next generation jammer, each generating 10 kilowatts of focused electromagnetic energy. The S-400 uses a 96L-6E acquisition radar. X-band frequency, 8 to 12 gigahertz. The Growler's electronic warfare officer locks onto that frequency and broadcasts. 50 kilowatts of electromagnetic noise directly on the S-400's operating frequency. Imagine trying to have a conversation while someone screams into your ear at 140 decibels. The S-400 operators see their screens filled with noise, random contacts, false targets. They cycle through backup frequencies, but the growler tracks them instantly. Russia sells the S-400 as an F-35 killer, claims 250 kilometer detection range, but the S-400 needs to see the target first. And the growlers make absolutely certain it never does. While growlers create electronic chaos, the F-35Cs hunt 44 Lightning IIs at 40,000 feet. Sensors active, radar in passive mode. The F-35's distributed aperture system is six infrared cameras. It doesn't need radar to see, it detects heat. Operating radars generate thermal signatures visible from 100 miles away. Any S-300 or S-400 battery that activates its radar becomes a beacon. The F-35's computer flags it, and an AGM-88G, AARGM, ER missile can launch. The anti-radiation guided missile, homes on electromagnetic emissions. The radar operator has two choices, turn off and go blind or stay active and become a target. There's no winning move. This is what air superiority actually means. Not that we shot down their aircraft. We made operating their defenses irrational. We removed every option except surrender without forcing direct confrontation. By phase three's completion, Venezuelan airspace is uncontested, not through violence, through physics and mathematics. Every defense neutralized, every radar blind, every command center isolated. But here's the paradox. To extract a high value target from a hostile capital, stealth isn't always the answer. Sometimes the optimal solution isn't to disappear. It's to flood the battle space with noise, too much signal, until nothing beneath it is considered abnormal. The USS Ford pushes its systems to surge tempo EMOL cycles every 45 seconds, F-35C. Lightning II's launch continuously in rotation. Not for strike missions, for presence. The F-135 engine at full military power. 43,000 pounds of thrust per aircraft. But they're not staying at 40,000 feet. They descend to 500 feet above downtown Caracas. At this altitude, the sonic signature measures 130 to 140 decibels on the ground, above the threshold of pain. Reports on the ground sounded like explosions, but technically, they were wrong. Those weren't munitions impacting the ground. That was 140 decibels of raw kinetic energy hitting the nervous system. At 500 feet, the F-35 stops being a jet and becomes a psychological weapon. And it's not one aircraft, it's continuous rotation. As one F-35C completes its pass and climbs, another descends. The roar never stops. There are no gaps, no silence. This is acoustic saturation. Ground forces don't hear an invasion. They hear what the Ford has been doing for six weeks, just louder. The sensors get overloaded, not by malfunction, but by excess information and beneath that sustained fury, 
four MH-47G Chinook helicopters approach at 50 feet above the water. Normally, you hear a Chinook from miles away. Twin rotors generate 100 decibels, but when F-35Cs overhead generate 140 decibels continuously, 100 decibels becomes inaudible. The Chinooks aren't hiding. They're being swallowed by the calculated chaos above. The Delta Force team walks through the front door, while the doorman is covering his ears. While every soldier in Caracas is looking up at stealth fighters that have abandoned stealth, trying to understand why they're announcing their presence so aggressively. This is the weaponization of paradox. You defeat detection not by being silent, but by making everything else silent in comparison. The loudest thing on the battlefield becomes the camouflage. This is the final phase, not violence, not stealth. Inevitability made audible. So, the final question isn't, how fast did the network collapse? The real question is, when did the enemy actually lose? Many assume the defeat began when the first Tomahawk missile left the rail. They are wrong. The victory was sealed six weeks earlier, during the phase we call the Silent Siege. The US Navy didn't dismantle the enemy with firepower. We dismantled them with habit. For 48 days and nights, we didn't just harvest data, we were reprogramming the enemy's expectations. By conducting hundreds of routine patrols, we taught their radar operators a lethal lesson that American presence is just routine, that these signals are harmless. We turned the most dangerous fleet on Earth into background noise. The enemy didn't lose because they couldn't see us. They lost because they saw us every single day until they stopped fearing us. And when the strike finally came, it wasn't a battle. It was a singular kinetic moment, a flash of execution, a mere administrative formality, to close a file that had been written weeks in advance. The speed of the collapse wasn't measured in minutes on a clock, but in the processing cycles of a stunned command structure. In the modern era, the most terrifying weapon isn't high explosive. It is patience. When you turn your enemy's perception into your camouflage, you don't fight to win. You simply wait to collect. If this analysis of weaponized psychology shifted your perspective on naval dominance, verify your attendance in the briefing room by hitting that subscribe button. We are here to decode the engineering behind the silence.